Hey everybody, Tim Anderson here, aka Renfell, and welcome to my overview video for Divinity Original Sin, the Definitive Edition Part 2. Uh, not a lot I can say about this game other than it's awesome. <laughs> Well, I'll dive in a little bit more into greater detail, but before I do, I want to say thanks to everybody for supporting, for following along, etc. Thanks for your love over here on YouTube, um, and also for following along over on Twitch. I've been live streaming this game daily for the past uh, few days, and it looks like I'm going to be continuing to live stream this game uh, leading up to the launch of Baldur's Gate 3, which has now been pushed back a little bit to... October 6th, sad phase, QQ, but it gives me more time to play this game, which is not a bad thing. So I should preface this by saying that I actually bought this game a year ago, more or less. Uh, I picked it up on GOG.com the day, I think it was the day or the day after that Baldur's Gate 3 was announced. Uh, GOG did a big deep dive discount on Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2. I think I picked them up for like $15 for the pair. I immediately played the first game pretty hardcore. Um, it took me a little over a month to get through. Um, it was such a deep and meaty game that I didn't turn around and immediately play the second one because I was busy with other stuff and I didn't have time to just you know, dive right back off into another deep dive into a game that I knew was going to suck up, you know, like a month of my time or so. Um, that being said, uh, over the last, you know, month, basically since September kicked off, I've been doing all my deep dives into the isometric games ahead of Baldur's Gate 3. So I've played Baldur's Gate 1, Baldur's Gate 2, I've done some Icewind Dale, I've done some Icewind Dale 2. I also went in and just for the hell of it, I've been playing Wasteland 3. These are all top-down isometric uh, RPGs that are largely either turn-based or pause-based. The one I haven't tapped into yet is Dragon Age Origins, which is another great game, but I'm gonna leave that for another point in time. Um, but since uh, since they pushed back the, the uh, early access launch of Baldur's Gate 3, I decided to go ahead and give Divinity Original Sin 2 a try and dive in. And I'm really glad I have. Um, it's, it's definitely proving to be an adventure that's worth the undertaking. Um, I think it's also worth noting that, uh, for me, um, I'm actually playing this a little different than I would typically do it. I've been doing it on the story mode, which is like the most generic, easiest version of the game, as opposed to like normal or classic. Um, and that's mostly because I'm primarily interested just in the storyline and just kind of having some fun um, and, and just kind of getting into things and, and seeing how the story plays out. Um, so for those who haven't ever played this game, it does pick up storyline wise hundreds of years after the first one. Um, the lore is pretty rich in this game, uh, and I've been looking at, you know, comparing this to like Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 as an example, and I think from my personal standpoint, I like the gameplay of Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 better. I think those games have richer systems, uh, but I think that, at least from my personal experience, this game... Um, has better dialogue and narration and the voice acting is great i especially love um being able to talk to animals i think that has added a whole nother level to my gameplay in the sense that you have these characters that you can interact with that are animals in the real world especially the the crazy <laughs> the crazy squirrel who follows you around on his undead skeleton mount uh has proven to be quite the uh amusement for me as I've gotten into this game. Um, let's dive in and, and just take it from here and I'll talk about some of the things I like, some of the things I don't like, and go from there. So to get going, um, I think one of the interesting things is since you can play this game multiplayer, I know that's something they're heavily factoring in to uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, my brother and one of his friends are actually playing um, this game together on the PlayStation 4. Now I'm playing it on the PC, so I've just got my own version of this set up. Um, but he is playing it on PS4 with his friend, um, and I'm just doing it here for myself. 
um, on the PC version. So, but you have the option to play with other people. Now, it's not cross it's not cross platform, so you'd have to find other people to play it with you on the PC. But I think that was an interesting because it's a throwback to, you know, the old Baldur's Gate one and Baldur's Gate two days of being able to play things online with your friends. Uh, jumping right in from there, you've got a variety of difficulty options: um, Explorer mode, Classic mode, Tactician mode, which has two levels of difficulty, uh, as well as story mode and having kind of tested a little bit of these difficulties out throughout the play sessions i guess even normal mode like classic mode is pretty freaking hard like you have to pay attention to things you definitely have to be strategic in your combat uh, whereas opposed to explorer mode a little less so in story mode it's really hard i've you know it's really hard to die like you have to really be screwing around and doing things wrong to die in combat whereas uh, explorer mode you still have to pay attention and and, and etc um, getting into character creation though I think one of the things that's really interesting about this game is that you're given a variety of these origins and each origin has its own story and there's a narration behind that story so you can kind of get an idea of what is the background of this character now of course you don't have to play that character you could choose to create one of your own characters from scratch but I think one of the things that you lose if you do it from scratch is that when you're doing it with one of these origin stories, you get some additional roleplay options in the text dialogue as well as the way some of the characters interact with each other because of your background. So I think it does definitely add to the game and definitely enhances the flavor of this game to be able to choose one of these origin stories. And there's quite a few to choose from. The other interesting thing to note is that you have so many options here. So each, you know, there's kind of like, if you come across these characters in the game, they all have their own kind of version. They're the preset option, like the Red Prince is a fighter um, and, and so on and so forth. Now, in the game, if you come across them, they give you the option when you're talking to them, they're like, not only am I good at this, I can also do this, this, or this. You just tell me what you want me to do. So you can choose why, whether or not you want them to be a, a caster or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these basically are these build presets that you see here in the character creation process as you're going through. There are these various options that you can choose from uh, in terms of you know, fighter, rogue, uh, so on and so forth um, but what's really cool I think is that not only can you go in and, and change the preset for the character as you're doing this character creation so yeah he's got a storyline you know the storylines are unique and etc and that's the role play aspect of the character but you can then go in and tweak like let's say you pick the fighter build or the rogue build you can then go in and actually edit the talents you can edit the abilities you can edit all these different things for the character so you're not stuck with whatever that preset option is the other thing i really like when you're doing the character creation is as you're modifying like the hair and the beard and the face and everything else it's actually modifying the icon for your character as well so it's it's really adaptive in the sense that it allows you to see in real time what your icon is going to look like instead of like say the old games like Baldur's Gate 1 or 2 you're just given a whole bunch of you know generic icons that you have to choose from in this game the icon changes as you make your character look unique which I thought was a really cool different things so you know from being able to modify the way your character looks to then being able to go in and tweak the various abilities and skills um, and talents for your characters you have a lot of control over the way that you can make your character at the beginning of the game now I played through two or three different free builds and I put about six hours into each one before I finally decided that I wasn't a hundred percent happy with the way that these pre-built uh, characters were set up so I went ahead and started a character from scratch that kind of took the approach of I want to be an archer thief 
So I started off with the archer preset, but then I went in and I modified all the talents and all the abilities and everything else to give myself the abilities that I actually wanted while carrying on the Ethan Bezmez storyline because I really liked the way his storyline was. It's like this ex-crusader who kind of you know lost his religion and lost his faith in the cause, and now he's just a mercenary for hire. I really thought that that storyline was kind of cool. So I wanted that storyline, but I wanted the ability to have this character be what I wanted as opposed to using these these presets so that kind of gets you past the character creation and into the actual meat of the game and this is where I can say that one of the things I don't like about the game and it's the same critique that I mentioned I believe I mentioned this in both my I, I bet I've mentioned it in all I know I mentioned it in the Baldur's Gate 1, Baldur's Gate 2, and Icewind Dale over videos I haven't done my Icewind Dale 2 video yet um, but my one complaint is that I'm stuck with only having four parties, 40, four, four, ugh, four members in my party, which is not something I'm a big fan of. I really like the old school take on having six characters in your party, and I really, really wish that Baldur's Gate 3 was going to allow you to have six players in your party, but they've opted to stick with their four-man party system, which is something they did with the original Sin 1 and original Sin 2. So if I had to say that the one thing that I don't like um, is that you know you have that limitation, which means you are fairly limited in what you can have in your party, and you really have to make choices. You're not going to be able to have everything. You're not going to be able to have all the skills, all the talents, etc. You're going to have to pick your battles. At the most, because here's the tricky part about this game, you don't want to let yourself get too far down the rabbit hole of a jack of all trades class because you'll start to get to the point where you're too weak as you're going up against some of these scenarios and encounters because you are expected to sort of specialize at least in in one or two directions so pretty much everything everybody in this game kind of starts off in the preset builds you notice that they kind of give everyone like two different builds that they're that they are like you know the you know, going into like the the ranger, you know, you've got geomancy and you've got, or maybe that's the wayfarer, excuse me, you've got geomancy and you've got the hunter abilities. So it's a little bit of spell casting with a little bit of, of hunter and archery. Um, and that kind of plays out throughout all of these preset builds. But as you get into the game, you start to realize that it's kind of better if you specialize your characters in one area. And I'd say at this point with my characters, I'm probably focused on having like 75% focused in one area with like 25% and sort of this secondary kind of backup thing. Um, one of the things I noticed immediately throughout my first couple of playthroughs as I was kind of testing the game was that you don't meet anybody that has thieving. So there was no way for me to disarm traps that I was coming across. There was no way for me to open some of the chests or some of the doors that I was coming across because my abilities were always too low because I didn't have any thieving. And because my characters had been specced towards other things like warfare or you know ranged or so on and so forth i was never able to take advantage of that side of the game so when i recreated my the character that i've been playing now for the longest my, my main character now he's primarily a ranger you know with ranged abilities but he has the backup in thieving which allows me to take care of all the traps i come across open all these doors that i couldn't get into previously open all the chests and so on and so forth so that's one of those aspects of only having four characters in your party is that you're always going to be slightly limited compared to a six-man party system, and you have to really pay attention to the choices you're making in terms of the abilities of your characters and the makeup of your group, who complements who, and go from there. So the group that I'm taking through right now is the Red Prince, who I've got spec just purely as a fighter, and then I've got my uh, Ranger slash Thief. And I've got Fane set up as uh, fire magic and pretty much nothing, but he does have a point in polymorph and a point in uh, geomancy because he's got some cross skill abilities that require both. They require two different things for him to use, so I've got him, you know, at least somewhat multi spec so he can tap into these other unique abilities. Um, and then I'm also running. Lassa, I think is her name, the, the bard character. I say a bard, but she's actually an elementalist, which is like a, a healer slash damage dealer. Um, kind of like ice, ice magic and heals. So um, I've got her in my party as well. And I've got her primarily focused on 
um, healing for the party as well as doing backup damage with the uh, the ice magic. So I've got a nice combination of characters and abilities as I'm going through the game. Uh, going back to the dialogue and etc. I think that's one of the the coolest things that I like about this game. I actually the first time I tried this, I had a wayfarer who could talk to animals. The second run through, um, when I was testing, I took a character that didn't have the ability to talk to animals. And for me, the ability to talk to animals was so cool and added such another layer of gameplay to my experience and, and also additional quests um, that when I went back and rolled the character that I was actually going to play, I just bypassed the other things that they wanted me to take and I went straight for the, the talk to animals ability because there is such a wealth of additional content that's out there if you can talk to the animals of the world um, not the least of which is the crazy squirrel man who's going on about the great acorn uh, attacking the world and the apocalypse I mean it's just it's an amazing little side character and if you don't have talk to animals it's just this random squirrel who's following you around and if you try to talk to him he's always just squeeze squeeze and you have no idea what he's saying but being able to talk to animals you can talk you know it's great you know coming across rats and crabs and dogs and cats and all these other characters that can add an, you know sort of another level to your gameplay another dimension um, so that's a lot of fun um, dialogue again probably my favorite thing about this game is the dialogue um, it's incredibly rich the voice acting is absolutely stupendous uh, probably the best i've seen in an rpg in quite some time so for me um it's really easy for me to just sit here and uh, listen to the voices and get into the character's head and really feel what's going on and then because my character isn't voiced i actually get to role play the character so as i've been playing on twitch um you know being able to choose my options and then they just kind of give you a vague you know kind of a vague um, description of what you're saying to the other characters but I've been able to look at that read it and kind of put my own flair into that so that I'm I'm role-playing my character in this way and so I'm answering using their text as a guideline for how I want my actual dialogue to sound like and then it rolls right into their answer to that question which is a great for me it's a great great way to do things it's a lot of fun I know that that's also what they're doing for Baldur's Gate 3 so I'm really looking forward to the role-play aspect of Baldur's Gate 3 um, so, all that being said, um, going through Divinity Original Sin 2, um, like I said, it's 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 definitely proving to be a very good game. I haven't played it long enough to be able to determine, you know, where it fits into my, you know, into my scale of favorite RPGs or so on and so forth. But it is a lot of fun. I have been playing it every day for the past, I think, like four days now, five days now. Um, and I have no plans on quitting anytime soon. This is kind of something I rolled into right after I finished. Uh, I did the Smuggler storyline, class line on Star Wars The Republic. Then I turned around and I was doing a trooper for a few days. And then just on a whim, I decided to log this, you know, roll this up and, 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 and uh, log into it one day. And immediately found myself like six hours later going, did I really just do like a six hour session of just like... And then I was like, ah, this is great. Tomorrow I got to try another character and, and see how I like that. And then by the third day, I'd gotten enough of knowing what I needed to do that I, I, I created the character that I've been playing now for the past uh, couple of days. And I will be continuing to play this character all the way through, or at least all the way through until Baldur's Gate 3 Early Access launches. And then I may just have to put this to the side and finish it up later. But I'm really enjoying it. I'm going to see if I can't wrap it up. I've got a couple of weeks... Um, uh, not quite a couple of weeks, like uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, like 11 days or so until Baldur's Gate 3 comes out. So we'll see how deep I can get into the storyline and if I could wrap it up or not. Um, but yeah, I think this is a great game to play. Uh, I was surprised that I hadn't, you know, not surprised I should say, but I, I, I know why I didn't play it before because I was so busy with other things. But now that I'm actually getting a chance to sink my teeth into it, you can see why Larian Studios was able to finally earn the right to make a Dungeons and Dragons game because you know they've talked candidly about you know how they they you know championed for the right to make a Baldur's Gate 3 you know they were really looking forward to and wanting to work with Wizards of the Coast etc on on a Dungeons and Dragons project but the the uh, the reception was always like eh, your company hasn't done enough it has not been around enough you know we really would need to see more from you and then because of the success of original sin one and original sin two it allowed them to get past that 
and actually get the contract and and it's looking like what they're doing is they're taking the lessons they learned from divinity one and two and taking it up a notch because divinity two doesn't have all of the motion capture and everything else that Baldur's gate three is going to have so i'm really looking forward to that but from what i'm seeing of the storyline and the narrative and the depth of the lore and the writing and everything else that i'm seeing from original sin 2 i have high hopes for Baldur's gate 3 and i can't wait to play it so thanks again for everybody following along i hope you guys enjoyed this overview video if you've played divinity original sin 2 and you liked it feel free to drop a comment below don't forget to subscribe hit the bell icon if you want to get updates when the new videos are going live and of course follow along over on twitch where i game pretty much every single morning um, technically my schedule is like 9 a.m. to noon central, but I'm online usually most mornings by 7 or 8 in the morning central time. And I usually play for three or four hours before I go off and do real life work for other things. So thanks again for your support. Thanks for tuning in. And I will see you in the next game, which will probably be as an FYI, I pre-ordered Star Wars Squadrons. So I'll be starting that uh, October 2nd which is next Friday. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. So I'll be streaming that and also um, doing an overview video for that in the following week. So stay tuned for all that stuff. Otherwise, I'll see you next week with more Divinity Original Sin 2 over on Twitch. And I have no idea what I'm doing next week for YouTube. Probably uh, Icewind Dale 2 and Apex Legends because I've been playing a little bit of both of those to get some, get some more content. So stay safe, everyone. See you next time.